You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A special welcome to any visitors with us today, uh, and also those who join us online. As we'll be receiving the Lord's Supper today, uh, we would encourage you to get out some form of bread and some form of the fruit of the vine so that you might be able to join with us today. Special welcome to all who have gathered here on this first Sunday in December, and for me, the first Sunday in Advent, as we rejoice that our God is mighty to save. So let's share that good news with one another. We rise.
no hope. Oh, here we go. And the music is calling us to go back to our, our seats. I am so glad I'm in a congregation where people are glad to be in the house of God. So it's time for announcements. So if there are any announcements for the body of Christ, I would encourage you to come forward at this time. One quick one from me, though, is the, a big thank you for all the people who are involved in decorating and making the sanctuary look so beautiful this morning. There you go. It'll work eventually. Operation. Yeah, it always works after you start talking. everybody for Operation Christmas Child, and I'm still taking donations, um, items, and money, and whatever for next year. Um, thank you all for helping out. Um, I got a total for how much we packed in our area. That includes Adams, Nakusa, Plover, Valpaca, Valtoma, Rapids, and Rightnita. I think that's how you say it. All of our areas is 10,515 shoe boxes we've got this year. And I don't know how much we did last year, so. <laughs> um, and also, I was thinking having a peony party probably in the summer or spring, if the Lord's willing. And I'm taking ideas if you guys want to, what you want to paint, if you want to join me in having a painting party. And like always, thank you for helping out. And I'm always, I'll be here for donations or whatever thank you need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the Lord for the ministries he's raising up there. Um, I'd like to invite every one of you to the soup supper coming this Wednesday. Uh, 5.30 is the time. We hope to see all of you there for our annual Advent Soup Supper. Come and enjoy the fellowship and um, the soup and the sandwiches as well. And, and, yes. and, and singing. singing. You How do you lose the Christmas carols. Yes. Sing them together. Okay, yes. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is to say thank you to all of you for the Wim Christmas in November project with all the little stockings on the tree. Um, we were able to send $535 to Love Incorporated this, this season. So we thank and praise the Lord. Love Inc. really stands for love in the name of Christ. And we're so thankful for that ministry among us. So I was studying the uh, scriptures uh, in this season, uh, the theme that God really spoke to me about for our message today is that uh, word which Zechariah penned and then sang over his son, but really prophetically it spoke to Jesus. This is Luke 1, He will give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God through which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and to guide our feet into the path of peace. Last Sunday, I posed three questions to you. And today, I just have one. <laughs> Yay. Think of the toughest situation you have gone through this year or in the last couple years. Give you a moment just to bring that to mind. There might be more than one. As you think back on it, what are some things you have learned about yourself? What are some things that you have learned about others in your life? And what are some things that you have learned about God in that situation? I'll just leave you with that today. 
from Luke 1. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. He has raised up the power of salvation for us from the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. Amen. Please rise if you are able. <laughs> Three, one. 
for something that you know he's done for you. Not to mention the cross <laughs> and his amazing blood washes us, cleanses us, heals us, delivers us. Thank you, Jesus. We love you this morning. We love you this morning. We worship your name. We worship your great name, Jesus. We honor the blood. We honor your blood, Jesus. Perfect sacrifice, Lamb. You're welcome, Lord. You're welcome in this house. open our hearts to you, Lord. We open our hearts. Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, we let the
give you something that cost us this morning. We bring you our worship. We bring you our song of love, our song of love. Sing thank you. you higher.
stand in awe of the fact that you enter into this sin-filled world to so show grace and mercy. We bow the knee at the foot of the cross where, Lord, you purposefully went for us that we might be your own. We stand in awe at the empty tomb, but all of that happened so that you would be with us, Jesus that you would be the God who is Emmanuel, that your presence would fill the praises of your people, that we would know your presence, your joy, and your peace on earth, and that we would join with the saints and the angels to sing your glory forever. So be with us in these days, O oh Lord. Help us to slow down and to look to you and see all that you have accomplished so that we truly, truly may have the fullness of what you came to give us. In Jesus' precious name we pray and all of God's people in agreement declared. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Our lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. The birth of John the Baptist foretold. In the time of Herod the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? <laughs> I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent <clears throat> to speak to you 
and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife, wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Please rise for the next hymn. God rescue Mary, gentlemen. Father God, as we enter this season, Lord, and we are reminded of all of the joyous memories we have, the, the blessings as well as the pain, Lord, that oftentimes becomes very observant and very open in our lives in this season. We remember Jesus chose to come not to a perfect world or a perfect Christmas. He came to bear our pain, our sorrow, our affliction. So, Lord, in this season, help us, even in the midst of that which we do not like, to remember that's why you came, to bear it for us, so that we, in the midst of our troubled world, might truly be the children of God and point others to you. We ask this in your precious name. Amen? Now, as I was 
uh, preparing for Advent and, and uh, looking at some of the hymns I love. And by the way, if we don't sing the hymns you love, you need to tell me so that we can include them. But also, come Wednesday, and then you can ask. But as I was studying them, I was surprised. Uh, a couple of those surprises I shared with you in the newsletter, so take some time to look at that. But also surprised by the carol we just sang. Um, God rest ye merry gentlemen. I was surprised in that. I kind of expected that to be one of those carols that was written in Dickens' time, you know? Uh, during the... Uh, writing of a Christmas carol, or you hear it sung by the carolers there. It just seemed like merry old England, you know. But it was written over two centuries before that. In the mid-1600s, this carol was written. And as I was looking at this carol in particular, I was reminded of a merry gentleman. Now, we probably wouldn't call him that because we don't understand those words, and we'll delve a little more into them a little later on in the message. But the merry gentleman that I found was the servant of the Lord, the one that God had cho chosen to accomplish his mighty purpose through a man, an ancient man, or as the carol calls it, a merry gentleman, by the name of Zechariah. And even though Zechariah doesn't respond in the way we think we might, nevertheless, God chose him to accomplish his special task through him. Now, the, the hymn that we uh, sang is not talking about God's provision for aristocrats sadly in need of merriment and slumber. No. It's for people just like us. And that's what Zechariah is just like. So let's look at his story to see what it says to our story in our day. And we're turning to Luke Luke chapter 1, and I want to read beginning at verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, the the miraculous story goes along as I guess we might expect it to until, until the time of the visitation occurs. And Zechariah responds in a way that hardly seems like a child of God. Let's listen to his words now. And I'm going to read them in verse 18 from the Message Bible. Zechariah said to the angel, Do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man, and my wife is an old woman. <laughs> I think Peterson's paraphrase, paraphrase really makes, uh, really is pretty good. Zechariah questions. He questions the very word of God. And yet, God, who knew his response before he ever sent the angel, chooses to send it to Zechariah. Because God had chosen him, not because he's perfect, because he was his chosen servant, to accomplish his purpose in that time. Now, as I was studying this, I came across a quote from a 19th century Bible expositor who has these words to share. I think maybe he had Zechariah in mind when he wrote them. You'll find them in your notes. He said, The holiest actions of the holiest saints are full of 
imperfections. <laughs> imperfections. They are either wrong in their motive or wrong in their performance. They are nothing more than splendid sins. Splendid sins deserving God's condemnation. Now, you don't hear sentences like that in the church too often these days. Uh, we're more interested in, in lifting the saging self-esteem of the saints than we are, like J.C. there, of telling it like it is. Now, it seems to me, maybe, maybe he had in mind Zechariah. But the wonderful, and so the wonderful news of our text is not that God found a perfect father or that God found a perfect mother either, sorry Elizabeth, but God found two sinners who in grace and mercy he chose to reveal his purpose and bring the Messiah into the world. And so we might very well entitle Zechariah's story this morning, Good News for Average? Above Average? No. Good News for Poor Performers and Splendid Sinners. <laughs> Good News for Poor Performers and Splendid Sinners, just like Zechariah, just like you and me. So let's continue to read. I want to go back to verse 6 and read that again, because I think it might be misunderstood. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Now, us as New Testament Christians might read some ideas into those words that Luke had never thought of sharing with us. And that is that God did find two perfect people to bring John the Baptist in the world, but not at all. What Luke is really talking about is that these two sons and daughters of God had chosen to be observant Jews, that they would live their lives under the tabernacle of the laws, rules, regulations, and meaning. Now, they lived in a time when many of the Jews had decided, hey, let's live like the Romans do. That's better than our heritage. Or many of them also chose to be like the Greeks. Many of them had set aside the laws and the commandments of the Lord, but not Zechariah and not Elizabeth. They were observant Jews, choosing to seek to live under God's guidance and with God's blessing. Got that? Not perfect by any means, but under God's tabernacle. And yet still, though they lived under God's tabernacle, what was the result? They couldn't have children. How sad. That would be sad in any generation. But particularly in this century where everybody had an answer for that problem. While God calls Zechariah and Elizabeth blameless because they're living under his tabernacle of the law. The tongues of the neighbors were all wagging. Yep. We know he's a priest, but we know he must have did something bad before he put on the robes because God is not giving them any kids. We know what's really happening. The sad thing is that we in the Christian church have come along and tried to put more shame on Zechariah. After all, we say, he received an angelic visitor just like Mary did. But he didn't respond like Mary did. Zechariah was not a good man. Again, how does God's word describe him? A righteous and blameless man. 
Now, if we're going to compare Zechariah's response to the angel to Mary's, we need to also look at the surrounding circumstances in the life of Zechariah and Elizabeth as well. So let's turn and look at Luke a little later on. We'll see how Mary responds to the angel. In Luke 1 at verse 34, we read, Mary simply replied, How will this be since I'm a virgin? Then later on at verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May it be done to me according to your word. Even though Mary's promise is far bigger, right? <laughs> and so therefore, far harder, oh. <laughs> far harder for her to believe. Yet how does she respond? Mary wants understanding. How can this be? Zechariah, on the other hand, wants proof. <laughs> he wants proof. But Zechariah's response is very familiar to us as human beings, isn't it? You see, Mary was a pious woman, and so she had been praying, as her parents taught her, for a righteous husband and that they would have many children. Mary was of marriageable age, and though she was young, she was well prepared to have children. But Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for over 50 years. Can you imagine? Well, some of us here can imagine. I don't think anyone here has prayed for a child for 50 years, but most of us have been praying for our children for maybe even longer than that. We've prayed that they would come back, come back to the faith, that our grandchildren would embrace the faith that we once taught their parents. And we watch and we pray. So, what's easier? To pray for a child who is yet to be born, that they would grow up in the faith, or to pray for the child you've been praying for for 50 years, and there hasn't been an answer yet. Some of you know exactly how that feels. That's where Zechariah was. Can you understand how he responds to the angel? Why? Why now, after 50 years? How come? That's the response. And God, in grace and mercy, listens to his prayers and his questions. Even as he listens to our prayers, and our questions. And he speaks into our lives through a, a beautiful promise that's found in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 at verse 8, where we read, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years! The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Now, that's an important promise to be sure, right? But when you're in the midst of praying for not a thousand years, but 50 years, <laughs> you kind of wonder. And so God inspired Peter to go on in that portion of Scripture to write these words. Instead, God is patient. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance and to come to the knowledge of the truth, as, as Paul shares in Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Why, Lord? How come? How long do we have to pray? 
Is your answer no? I may not know the answers to all your questions, but this one thing I do know. The heart of the Heavenly Father has ached over that child a lot longer than yours. His desire is that that child, that grandchild, that beloved God child, that nephew and niece, all of those that are represented here in our prayers for our children, have been on his heart for thousands of years. He knows your pain. He longs for the day when he will bring to fullness the plan that he has for them. But just like the angel with Zechariah, God is saying, will you trust me with them? Pray for them, yes, but place them into my hands and not your hands. I will do what I desire. God is patient. God is patient with you, not wanting one of them to perish, but they would all come to the knowledge of the truth. So God whispers into Zechariah's heart and into our heart, nothing, no thing, will keep me from accomplishing my heart's desire for them. For those whom I said Jesus to die for, they will be mine. Now, we may marvel when these miracles happen in the Bible or in the life of others we've heard about, but when they happen in our life, we wonder what in the world is going on. Just ask Zechariah. The story goes on. We read uh, at verse 19. Then the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. At least I think he might have said it like that. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you, to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent. <laughs> you will be silent silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Now, we need to remember God's not being vindictive here. He is not holding a grudge against Zechariah for his unbelief. No. God knows who he's working with. Amen? Amen? God knows who he's working with here. He knows that we're clay, but he longs to mold us. The beautiful truth is God loved Zechariah just the way he was, but he loved him too much. He loves us too much to allow us to stay this way. So he allows these things to come into our life that will help us become the sons and daughters he wants us to be. As he tells us through the author to the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 12 at verse 5 we read, Have you forgotten the encouraging words? These are encouraging words. God spoke to you as his children. He said, My child... Don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes or corrects from the Greek. Each one he accepts as his child. In the days of Zechariah, many had chosen to live the way of the Romans the way of the Greeks. And what was that way? Well, look outside. It's happening still today. Those in power of servants and of slaves would oftentimes have relationships with them. And the children that they would bear into the world would not be accepted as sons and daughters. Oh, 
They might be gifted. They might have pleasure. But they would never receive the training, the education, and the correction that was necessary for one to be a Roman citizen. They were unimportant. The author to the book of Hebrews tells us, God will never treat you like that. You are his precious one. You are his daughter. You are his son. So he longs to bring you into the fullness of what he has for you, that you might receive your full inheritance because he loves you so much. Because he loves you so much. Now there's one more word I would like to read from the story of Zechariah. This is in Luke chapter 1 at verse 14, early on in the story. But this is a word each and every one of us needs to hear. The Lord said to Zechariah, he says to you and me, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Your prayer Your prayer has been heard. Of course, Zechariah and Elizabeth knew God hears our prayers. We know, don't we? God hears our prayer, but after 50 years, you kind of wonder. Maybe the answer was no. No. But when we pray with God according to his will, his answer to us is wait even if it has been 50 years. Wait with me, my beloved. Know that I bear the pain that you bear for that loved one. That they are in the center of my hands and in my will, and though things may not go well for them from an earthly point of view, I will bring them home. I have heard your prayer, says the Lord. And so God speaks into Zechariah's heart and into his life. But first of all, Zechariah needed to listen. He had to listen to the heart of God to understand his will. So a God arranges at least nine months <laughs> if not more, of listening for Zechariah. I, I don't know if I should say this joke aloud, but maybe some of us would be better off <laughs> with nine months of silence, though it might be hard to be a pastor. Nevertheless, God speaks into his life in those days, and in those days of waiting, I believe, Zechariah began to pen the world's first Christmas carol. Listen to the heart of his song. We read again those beautiful words at verse 77. For he will give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. This, then, is the world's first Christmas carol written in the heart of a sinner, just like you and me. But I believe... I can find good old, merry old Zechariah in that Christmas carol we sang a little earlier today. Because in that song, written in the mid-17th century, the English language meant something else, <laughs> something different than the words that we think. So let's look at that carol once again. The word Mary 
in ancient English did not mean jovial. <laughs> there was very little to be jovial about in the, the mid-17th century. But rather it meant strong and valiant one. Like, if you remember, Robin, Robin Hood's merry men, strong and valiant, and dare I say, even a righteous man like Zechariah. And rest did not mean slumber, but rather it meant to accomplish, to bring about, to make. God make you strong and valiant. And gentlemen, that didn't mean aristocrats, but rather someone who is vigilant and loyal, or dare I say, a righteous man. Do you, you see why I see Zechariah in this song before us? The angel declared to him, God make you strong and valiant, a righteous man, Zechariah. Let nothing let nothing you dismay. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Only believe. Only believe. Remember, Christ, the Messiah, our Savior, will be born for you. And he'll save you. He'll save you all from Satan's power when you had gone astray. Certainly, Zechariah knew something about Satan's power. His deceptiveness, his destruction, his trials and troubles that he brings in this world. And, well, so do we. Don't we? So do we. And so this really is good news good news for poor performers <laughs> and splendid sinners, isn't it? And oh, it's tidings of comfort and joy. Tidings of, of comfort and joy. And isn't that what we really need in this season. So let's now join our hearts to share it again. This time, share it with your brothers and sisters as we sing our song, We Rise.
Tidings of comfort and joy. Fear not, sons and daughters of the king. Your king has seen you in his need. And so when he came among you, he gave a gift so that we would never doubt that he has heard our prayers. For on the night before he was betrayed, he thought not of himself, but of you and me. He took the bread, and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember. I see you. I know your needs. I've heard your prayers. And after the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, every one of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Pour it out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this every time you drink it, to remember me, to remember my love, to remember I hold your loved ones in the palms, the nail-pierced palms of my hands. Now for those who receive communion in the pews this morning, let's take that bread. The body of Jesus was broken so that we might be made whole. Take the cup, the blood poured out, that we might be the forgiven children of God. Now the Lord has prepared his table and he invites you to come.
Father God, as we lift up our tithes and offerings on this day, we also yield to you the prayers of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you have not forgotten, that your answer is not no. That you have heard the prayers for our children, our grandchildren, for those whom we love, who seem far from you. Thank you, Lord, that you are carrying out your plan to bring them home. We lift them before you, in Jesus' name. We join our hearts in the prayers for the family of God that gathers here at Bethlehem. Father God, we come before you for our nation, for our leaders, Lord. We pray, Father, that they would bow the knee before the throne and recognize they need to take their leadership from you. Bless them, Lord. Guide them and direct them in our days. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who serve us in a dangerous world, for our policemen and firemen, for the EMTs and medical workers. And we pray, Lord, for our military, Father, serving here at home or abroad. Lord, in the midst of the conflict of this world, we pray, draw all of these home to you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for our brother Ernie Gunther. Thank you, Lord, for a successful triple bypass surgery this past Monday. But Lord, Ernie has not been healing as well as they want. Yesterday was a day of setbacks. Lord, we lift him before your throne. We thank you for him and his faith, Lord. And we expect, O oh Lord God, by your grace and mercy, See a miracle, Lord, in his life. Restore him to wholeness so that he might serve you as your son. We pray, Heavenly Father, as well for, for Mabel Schmidt at home now in rehab, Lord God. Be with Sherry and Mabel. Hold them together in these days, Lord, of difficulties and yet of a, a, a greater sense of your love than ever. Draw them to each other and to you in that love. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Bonnie Young. Again, after a difficult week, now in rehab at Edgewater, Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, for healing and your peace and presence for her. We pray as well, Lord, for all those, Lord, who are suffering from the terrors of dementia. We pray for their caregivers, often, Lord God, overwhelmed. Give them, Lord, hope for the day. And Lord, remind them 
that one day their loved ones will know once again as they are known by you. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Tom and Jean Strand, Lord God, for your healing touch and restoration on their lives. We pray as well for Terry, for Jerry and Carolyn, for Betty, for Margaret, for Kim, for Warren and Anita, for Barbara, and for Bill and Karen, and many others, Lord, who are on our hearts and on our minds in these days. We lift them before you now in the words that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I want to return to our uh, chosen uh, theme verse for today, because as I read it, I thought of something else. He, that is Jesus, will give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. As I read those words, those prophetic words from the lips of Zechariah, it suddenly occurred to me, this is the fulfillment of the benediction that God had his priests speak over the children of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And now he has. For the Lord has turned his face towards us. And in Jesus, we have found his peace. Amen? So what are you waiting for? Come on! Let's ring those bells. We rise.